I'm not going to have you stand and read the scripture today as we normally do because I'm not going to immediately uh, read it and then we're going to turn to several passages and sort of analyze them together. Our, the message today is our commission and our call. And I hadn't thought about this message in relationship to it being the beginning of Missions Month, but I, I couldn't preach anything more appropriate for Missions Day than this. But I'm preaching it in the context of what I've been talking to you about with evangelism. Everybody's read and heard about the trends in America away from church. And I've thought and prayed and read and studied and talked to people who I consider to be more knowledgeable than myself. And I've come to this conclusion. The only thing churches are going to do to save themselves in the future is they're going to have to start obeying what Jesus told us to do and win people to Christ. People are not going to just come to church because it's the thing to do like they did in former years because the culture has changed. We've moved from a Judeo-Christian culture to a secular culture. We've moved from Acts chapter 2 where Peter spoke to the people and they all knew what he was talking about to Acts chapter 17 where Paul preached to the people and had to explain to them even who God was. And that's where we are in my opinion, in the time in which we live now. Now, having said that, I want to speak about our commission as individuals, as a church, as a mission-sending church, and our call. And it might surprise you to find out this morning that every one of you have that call. Every single person in this building has been called, whether you've ever thought about it or not. Now, we have in the Bible five times what we call the Great Commission. The first time it's mentioned is in Matthew chapter 28. And so I want you to turn in your Bible there with me, please. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 28. And I will begin reading in verse 16, and then we'll look at this a little bit more thoroughly. Then the eleven disciples went away unto Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some still doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The word power there is not the word for power like electricity. It's the word for power like the president has power. It means authority. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And then what we call the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, the Trinity. Teaching them to observe all the things whatsoever that I have commanded you. Now, he had been with them at this point for over three years. He had been teaching and training them for that entire period of time. And he said, I want you to go out and win people to the Lord, and then I want you to teach them everything that I've been teaching you for three years. And he said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So be it. Amen. Now, we refer to this as the Great Commission. What is a commission? Let's start by simply defining our terms. A commission is a formal written authority to act on behalf of someone else. Let me say it again. A commission means I have been given a formal written authority to act on behalf of another person. And for example, I think of an officer a person who joins the military meets the qualifications of being an officer, and so they send that person, that man or woman, off to what we call Officer's Candidate School, OCS. They put them through rigorous testing and training for a long time. At the end of that, they line them up. There's a graduation, and each one is given a piece of paper. It's called their commission. It tells them exactly what their, their role is going to be, what their 
authority is, the limits to what they can do, what they can do and what they cannot do, and then they're sent out to do it. Now, we refer to them as commissioned officers. They've been giving a, given a piece of paper with detailed instructions about their limits of authority, where they are to go and what they're to do. We contrast that with a non-commissioned officer who doesn't go through that period of preparation and training. And they go out, but they don't have that same written authority. They are under the authority of the commissioned officers in every case. So Jesus said to his people, I want you to do certain things to his disciples. The 11 were gathered with him, we see here, on a mountain. And he, he gave them this commission in, in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. But now, he then gave it four more times. So, five times in the New Testament, Jesus Christ gave the Great Commission. Now, listen up. I want you to get this. I've looked through my Bible. I can't find where Jesus Christ repeated anything else other than this five times. No other statement of Jesus, no other teaching of his is recorded five times over in the New Testament. From that alone, I think you begin to garner the importance of this. If the Lord Jesus Christ told us to do something five times, he probably was pretty serious about it. He probably meant it, didn't he? Five times he repeated the commission, and we're going to look at all five of those in the next few minutes. So this is the only thing he ever repeated that many times. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I'm going to give you a name for each of these, and so you might want to write it there in the margin of your Bible. This is called the Great Commission in Matthew 28. The Great Commission. It's the most comprehensive of the five repetitions of the Great Commission because he gives us a plan a strategy, a game plan, you might say, for what we are to be doing until he returns. Notice to whom it was given in verse 16, given to the 11 disciples in a mount, on a mountain in Galilee somewhere. Now, these 11 disciples, I believe, formed the church at that time, the only church there was. So he gave it to them as a church as a corporate body. If he were to come this morning and stand behind this pulpit and speak to our entire church congregation, that's what he was doing here. And that would mean that every single member of that church would be given this, this commission that is mentioned here. Now, he not only gave it to them, though, as a church, and it's the commission of every church. I don't care if you're Pentecostal or Lutheran or Baptist or Methodist, every church that would subscribe to following the pattern of the New Testament has this commission given to them, this written authority for what they are to be doing. But he not only gave it to the churches, and I believe he gave it to the church for, for another reason, he gave it to the churches because these 11 men were all going to die within a few years. And then the commission would have meant nothing. But you see, by giving it to a corporate entity, by an institution, a, a church, it gets passed down. And so our church is, at one time, was the baby of other churches. They supported us and helped us to begin. And so this commission gets passed down infinitely. It gets passed from church to church to church to church. Because churches give birth to churches generally, or they should be doing it. And so it's a corporate thing, but it's also an individual thing. And so the Great Commission given here is to you. You could write your name in there when it says, Go ye therefore, and I could say Bill Monroe. Go ye therefore. Put your name there. You are given that commission as one of the Lord's children. And what did he commission us to do? Verse 19, first of all, to evangelize. If, if you study this passage 
literally, here's what he was saying. As you go, make disciples. As you go. What do I mean by that? He wasn't saying to them, I want you to come and go out on visitation. What he was saying is, I want you, as you go on your normal course of life, as you go to work, as you come home in the evening and spend time with your family, as you go out and go to a uh, recreational activity, as you go and visit your relatives, wherever you go, anytime, anywhere, all the time, everywhere, I want you to be taking this commission seriously and taking the gospel and carrying out this evangelism commission. But he also said in verse 19, baptize. And individuals don't have the authority to baptize. We don't believe with a careful study of the Scripture. I won't go into it. But churches baptize. And so, again, this is a corporate responsibility as well as an individual responsibility. And so he says, you're to immerse these converts after they're saved in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It, you're to picture the gospel, and they are to make a public identification with the Lord Jesus Christ and His church. That's what baptism is. It's a public testimony. I am a Christian. I am a believer. I believe the gospel that Christ died, was buried, rose again. And so that's reenacted every time we baptize a convert. And then in verse 20, he said, I want you to teach them. And the idea there is discipleship, that you train people, and notice what he said, in everything that I've taught you. In other words, they have to know something. So we spend a lot of our time here teaching. Sunday school, and when I'm in the pulpit right now, I'm teaching. I'm teaching you what Jesus taught us, and I, I continue to teach. Teaching is, is the heart of all that we do. As I stand here and teach, I'm hoping that you learn, but not that you just sit here with a head full of information, but that you not only learn, that you do, that you go forth and you're obedient to what you have been taught. And, and somebody pointed out, and I think it's real interesting, isn't it? This commission begins with go, verse 19. It, that's a command, and it ends with a promise. Down in verse number 20, you see the word low. So you can circle go, and you can circle low in your Bible, draw you a little mark in between them there, and you've got the essence of the whole thing, that we are commanded to go, every one of us, with the gospel of Christ, and we have the promise of the Lord, lo, I am with you even to the end of the age or to the end of the world. Now, quickly go with me to Mark chapter number 16 in your Bible. Mark chapter 16, and this one's much shorter. He doesn't give us the detail, but it's a repetition of the commission. I call Matthew the Great Commission. I call this the Go Commission the Go Commission. And the reason for that is because it begins with the word go here. He said to them, go ye into all the world, there's the basis of missions, and preach the gospel to every single creature. And so we cannot be a New Testament church and not be a missionary-minded church. The reason we have this month of missions emphasis is because you must understand that we can't just care about Florence, South Carolina, that our vision, our goals must be far bigger than that. They must be as big as the world. And we're to go into all the world. Jesus said that. And we're to preach the gospel to every creature. That means you can't take the gospel of the wrong person, high or low. Doesn't matter who they are, their status or their standing it doesn't matter anything about them. If they are one of God's creatures, we are concerned about their soul. We want to get the gospel to them. Now, this is the shortest version. Well, no, it's not second shortest of the, of the five versions. And it's, but it's so succinct. Christ died for all. He wants everybody to hear the gospel. And what he says here, the emphasis is on go and preach. And the word preach is 
You think of it as being what I'm doing, and it is, of course, but it, the word preach, draw your circle around the word preach there and a little line out there somewhere. Here's what it means. It means to proclaim. And so I'm proclaiming here to a lot of people, but I meet somebody in the course of life tomorrow, an individual, well, I'm to proclaim to them as well. The responsibility, the, the preaching responsibility is not a man standing behind a desk here like I'm doing right now. It includes that. But it also means that we are to individually, personally proclaim that wherever we go, that we're to be giving out the gospel as best that we can, both in public and in private. It's a corporate responsibility for the whole church. It's a personal responsibility for every single, every single one of us. And notice what he says, we're to go. The church is to go. We're not to hang out a sign out here and say, y'all come. I don't know if there's a church in the world that doesn't have a sign somewhere that says, come or you're welcome. But that's not getting the job done for the Great Commission. We're not to wait for the people to come in. We're to go and take the gospel to the people. It, we are to, t- to be proactive in our endeavors with the gospel. And who? Every creature. I emphasize that again. Listen to me. Nobody is too bad to be saved. Nobody. Don't ever give up on anybody. I don't care how wretched they may be, how low they may have gone. Nobody is too bad to be saved. And listen to me, nobody is good enough to be saved without Christ. Nobody's too bad and nobody's good enough. Everybody needs Jesus Christ. Everybody needs his gospel. Amen. Now we go to Luke chapter 24, and we see the third edition here of the Great Commission. So we've had the Great Commission in Matthew. We've got the Go Commission in Mark, and in Luke we have the Gospel Commission, the Gospel Commission. And why do I call it that? Let's begin reading in verse 46. And he said unto them, this, thus it is written, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day. There's the gospel. Christ died and was buried and rose again. There's the gospel. So you got it right there. Christ said that to them. And he said that repentance and remission of sins. And a lot of people today don't want us to talk about repentance. They say it doesn't have anything to do with the gospel. My friend, they are so wrong. You see, there's repentance as part of the Great Commission. It behooved Christ to suffer and to resurrect from the dead the third day, and you're to go and preach repentance and remission of sins in his name among all nations. There's the missionary call again. Beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father. What was the promise of the Father? It was that coming of the Holy Spirit. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but I want you to tarry in the city of Jerusalem. I want you to wait right here until the Holy Spirit comes and you will be endued with power from on high. Boy, that's chock full of stuff there. The Gospel Commission. Verse 46, it begins with the Gospel. Verse 47, then... We're to take the gospel, but we're to call men and women to repentance and remission of sin through the shed blood of of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse number 47, we're to go to all nations with it. The word nations there, if you want to define it in your Bibles, ethnos. It doesn't mean nations like we think of nations exactly because we think of America and Canada and Mexico and so on. That means every ethnic group. That means every tribe, every language on the earth, every language group, that we are to take the gospel not only to the geographic big picture nations like the U.S., but you ever thought of how many ethnic groups are in America today? 
You have all the different kinds of people, red, yellow, black, white. You have people that pr- have all these strange practices. You've got people that preach, or that, pardon me, that speak in different languages. There must be 50 different languages spoken across the United States today. And so every kind of creature. See, there's this emphasis throughout. It's every creature. It's every kind of person. It's every ethnic group. There's nobody that we're not to consider when we go and take the gospel to them. And then in verse 48, I want you to notice what he said. He says, you are witnesses. You are witnesses. If you're a follower of Christ, you are a witness, meaning you're either a good witness or you're not a witness or you're an occasional witness or I don't know. You have to decide that in your heart. But you are a witness. And the Christian who lives a very wicked life is witnessing also, isn't he or she? And so they're living far from God and the world, the people around you see that. Every one of us, whether we have ever thought about it or not, we're witnessing by our life and by our speech. And people are reading our lives, and they're watching us, and they're saying, boy, Christianity is a beautiful, wonderful, powerful thing that changes people. Or they are saying, ah, the world is full of hypocrites who call themselves Christians. I hope that you're a true witness, that your life and your speech that it bears witness to the grace of God, that it, it gives credibility and integrity to the gospel that we say that we believe. And then there's something else in this passage in verse 49. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but you wait right here in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high, and there is the power for the Great Commission. The power is not in our money and resources. It's not our slickness and our ability to give the gospel. It's not that we are trying to reach people by being cool and attract people based on a cultural basis that they will think we're, you know, acceptable. The power of the gospel is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lies within every one of us. And it's not a matter, if you're a Christian, it's not how much of the Holy Spirit do you have, it's how much of you does He have. It's how much is He in control in your life. Are you surrendered to Him? Or are you going your own way and saying, Holy Spirit, don't bother me. I've got my own plans. I've got my own lifestyle here. Now just leave me alone. I just want to get saved enough that I can get into heaven. And I'm afraid that that's so typical so many today. Now we go to John. And we have the fourth version of the Great Commission before us. John chapter 20. And... This may have been the first time that Jesus gave it. And it was on Easter evening after he had resurrected, after he had walked down the Emmaus Road with the disciples. And now he stands before his disciples in a room in Jerusalem. And it says here in verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And he said unto them, receive the Holy Ghost. The first time the Holy Spirit ever came was not at Pentecost. It was right here. Jesus breathed on them. He said, I want you now to receive the Holy Spirit in your life. And so we call this the God-breathed commission. We have the Great Commission, the Go Commission, the Gospel Commission, and we have the God-breathed commission. And Jesus said, now notice what he said, as the Father sent me, just like I have been sent from heaven to the earth, so send I 
you. Just like I was willing to leave heaven and come to the earth in obedience to my Father, I'm sending you to all the creatures of the earth. You be obedient to me as I was sent, so you were sent. This has been the theme of 10,000 mission conferences, hasn't it? And so it should be because it defines in just a few words what this is about. Just as Jesus came, we are to go and we're to tell the good news of the Lord Jesus. And then the last time you find the Great Commission is one page over in the book of Acts chapter 1. It's at the end of each gospel and it's at the beginning of the book of Acts. And it's in verse number 8. And they're meeting somewhere in Jerusalem. Jesus, remember, stayed on the earth for 40 days after the resurrection. That's about six weeks. And what did he do during that time? He taught. He taught them how he wanted them to go and what he wanted them to do. He gave them every detail. He gave them everything they would need to be fully equipped to carry out this great commission. And so... In verse 8, he says, first of all to them, I want you to wait. Now, I want you to wait till the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then you will go out and be witnesses. Witnesses tell what they've seen and what they've heard, not secondhand news, what they've experienced. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in, both in, circle that word, both in, I know people that don't understand that. They don't, they didn't get that. And I, so I want you to, I want to emphasize it to you because Jesus said both in Jerusalem where you are right now, but then I want you to go to Judea, which was a little further out, and then in Samaria, further out still, and then the uttermost parts of the earth, everywhere on the earth, I want you to go. And I, here's what I want you to notice. He didn't say stay here in Jerusalem till everybody in Jerusalem is saved and then go to Judea. No. He said while you're evangelizing Jerusalem, both in Jerusalem and Judea and to the other most parts and so on. See, I, I know churches that spend 80%, 90% of their budget and brag about it. They're very proud of it spend 90% of their budget on foreign missions, and rarely reach anybody in their hometown. That's not what it says. I know other churches that spend every bit of their time and their effort and their money on themselves and don't give 2% to missions. That's not it either. See, it's both in. We are to be doing the Great Commission work in Florence, but in the United States, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. There's nowhere that we should not be involved in the, in the work of the Great Commission. And so I call that the Global Commission, starting at Jerusalem, going to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, we've tried to implement that philosophy through the years here at the Florence Baptist Temple. So this is the Lord's strategy. This is not Bill Monroe's idea here. This is the Lord's plan for local, national, and international evangelism and discipleship. It is the plan the Lord gave us. And very quickly, it's the mission of every Christian and every church. Every Christian and every church. This is our mission. Church, will you accept that mission? Do you think that don't you believe that was given to Florence Baptist Temple and to every member thereof? I believe that so strongly. I've led this church to do a couple things. About 25 years, when we moved into this building 27, 8 years ago, I had gone to Jacksonville to the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville. And I was so impressed. I keep having Jerry Vines here because I remember those days. Five or 6,000 preachers would gather down there, and they would give us a template for doing the Lord's work. I learned so much from them. And they had a big lighthouse on the platform down there, bigger than that one at that church. 
And I came home and I said, maybe, maybe uh, having that lighthouse will do something for us. Give us a little mojo that we don't have. So man built the lighthouse for us here in town. And we've had it up there ever since. We really had a little campaign at that time, the lighthouse campaign. And I thought, uh, well, after the campaign, I guess we'll take it down. Then I said, oh, no, we're not going to take it down. So when they carry me out, you can carry that out if you want. But that's going to stay as long as old WTM's around here. Because that reminds us every time we walk in the door, what does it remind us of? The Great Commission. We're the light bearers. It's our responsibility to put the light into Florence, South Carolina, and the surrounding area. And then we had our 50th anniversary, and somebody gave us the idea of the, the solar out here. So every time you drive in here, there's an impressive, I think, statue sitting out there. But it's not a religious relic. It's a reminder of our mission, of our plan of God's strategy, that we've got to do that, or we are not a New Testament church in any real sense. A lot of Christians excuse themselves, oh, I'm not called. Oh, yes, you are. Read those and see whether you are or not. Well, I didn't hear any call. Well, you need to listen again, friend. You have been called as a believer in Jesus Christ to this. And you know what, what you can do? You see, we all live in a different world. My world is primarily ministering to the people of this church. I, I wish sometimes I didn't have to do a funeral, didn't have to prepare a sermon. I could just spend a week going out and talking to people that don't go to church. I, I'd, I'd love to be able to meet 20 atheists this week. And I'd say, man, that's my new world. But my world right now is not that. But do you know what? The people of this church, you folks sitting in front of me, just part of the people of this church, you will meet those 20 atheists this week. They're out there in your world. Because you see, your world is where your, your world is your family, and your world is your workplace. And your world is the group of people that you uh, go to the ball game with as parents or you may be participants. Your world and, 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 and every person's world here is a different world from every other person's world. We kind of overlap a lot, but we all have our own world, our world of workplace, our world of family, our world of recreation, our world of activities that we engage in. And you are meeting people I will never meet. You are meeting some people that nobody else, maybe in this whole congregation, will ever meet. And if you don't take the gospel to them and use your opportunities, they may never hear it. You're, res you're not responsible for the people in Brazil where God called Leland Johnson but we are responsible for the people in our world. And when Jesus said, go into all the world, he didn't mean the geographic world only. He meant the world of where we all live, our social world as well. The Great Commission is a process. It's been around since Jesus was here on the earth. And it's our job to continue it until he comes back. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Don't ever go to church and be satisfied that we just met, sung, heard a good sermon, and walk out the door and hope things work out. It's not the strategy. It's not to go to church, listen to Bill Monroe, go home and say that was a good sermon, or somebody may say it stunk but whatever, and just go on with life. You come to church so I can teach and train and encourage 
and inspire and motivate you so that we can go out, evangelize, baptize, disciple people who will keep on doing it and doing it and the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And that's the way you do it. It's God's plan. It's God's strategy. It's God's cause. It's God's mission. It's the very reason for our existence. If we were to vote, we're not going to do the Great Commission, then we ought to disband, sell the property, and close it down because it would be a joke. But churches don't ever say it that plainly. They just don't do it. But let's do it. Amen? Let's do it until Jesus comes. Why do we get together? Not so we can meet, sing, pray, preach, and go home, but because we are being prepared and equipped and encouraged. A dear man of God, he became an acquaintance of mine named Joseph Tan. He was the leader of the Baptist in Romania. He came and preached, as I've told you a number of times. And Joseph, because there were no Christian books in Romania, there was no help for the preachers. There weren't even any commentaries. Joseph began, became a translator, and he would translate great Christian books from English into Romanian. And Joseph made an observation that I'll never forget. He said, I observed in reading the sermons and the works of the old preachers, the Spurgeons and people like that, going back 50 and 175, 100 years. They use the word surrender to the Lord all the time. They challenge people to surrender, surrender. But he said, you see how words change in a culture over time. And he said, I began to read the new breed of preachers since since the 1900s or so. And they didn't use the word surrender. They used the word commitment. And Joseph said, that's a weaker word. Because commitment is, I decide I'm going to commit myself to something. But surrender, I give up. The dog quits resisting the trainer. He rolls over and puts his belly up in the air. He surrenders to the pack leader. And God has given us this commission. And I think we don't need to make a commitment as much as we need to make a surrender. Are you surrendered to the Great Commission? Or will you surrender that you'll give life, time, effort, money, heart, prayer to the Florence Baptist Temple doing this? This could be the most eternally significant year you've ever lived in your life. Let me tell you how. Just decide you're going to reach one person for Christ. One person. Maybe they're a a Christian and they're backslidden and away from God, not even living for the Lord. And you bring them and you get them here and you get their life on track. But even more so, the unsaved man and woman. And they're headed for an eternity without Christ. uh, An eternity separated from God. And you, they're in your world, not my world. I won't be able to reach them. But you might, and God will use you, and you'll see them saved, and you will make a difference for all of eternity, not just time, eternity. It's the only thing you'll ever take into the eternity is the souls you've led to Christ. Everything else, you'll leave it behind, but you can win somebody to Jesus, and you'll meet them on the other side. Stand to your feet with me, if you will, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning.